that's where we'll get started this morning. We're in, uh, this is session five. There's only 12 sessions. So this is session five. We're almost to the halfway Whoa. point. So let's pray and then we'll talk about it. Father, we thank you for this day you've given to us. Thank you that we can come together to study and study your word and think about different ways of studying your word so that we might better know you and know how you want us to be in Jesus' name. Okay, so in your notes, if you look at your notes, we're, we're talking about our town here and their town, which would be back in Scripture, back in the days of the New Testament. So in our town, here's an actual text message I received. This is from, well, I won't tell you who it's from, but it says, Good. Did you tell Matt there is Sunday school this week or there is SS this week? So look at that. That's a line of, that I got in a text message. Good. Did you tell Matt there is SS this week? So, what, what, is this, what is this about? What, what does this sentence mean? Good. Did you tell Matt there is SS this week? This text was communicating a message, and from the context and my knowledge of the sender, this is more than a question. This is actually, first of all, you have to know who the sender is, which it would be Michelle. I was the recipient, okay? Who's Matt? Cumberland. Okay, Cumberland, yeah. probably Matt Cumberland, although we know several Matts, but since this is in, uh, in church context, and there is SS, Super Sport. Okay. No, Sunday School. Sunday School. So, did you tell, did I tell Pastor Matt there was Sunday School this week? Did I tell him that? Uh, because I think it was a holiday. We, we, that would help, be also helpful if we knew what time frame was happening. I think it was a holiday. Sometimes we... We don't have Sunday school like on Christmas or Easter morning. We won't have Sunday school. But on this particular holiday, we were going to have Sunday school. Did I tell Matt so that, he, so that he's ready to teach teen, his teen Sunday school class? But this is not just a question, is it? No. It's also a polite, here's your blank, request. This is a polite request. She's reminding me to tell Matt there's Sunday school. So she could have said, hey, tell Matt to get his Sunday school lesson ready. But that, that would be uh, more direct than necessary for, for uh, Michelle to communicate. So she said, did you tell Matt about Sunday school? You know, it's, it's a polite request. But... See, you know that instinctively because you're English speakers. You're Michiganders, right? I mean, you know how we talk. You're, uh, many of you have been Baptists for a long time. You're familiar with Sunday school. But someone who was from another country, not a, a Baptist, would look at this and really have to figure it out. What, what is going on? You know it because you're so familiar with our language and the way we communicate, the way we text. So, in studying the Bible, it's very helpful to know what's going on and what kind of, what part of the Bible you're reading. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is this idea of genre. Genre, sounds like a fancy word. What does genre mean? It's a type of writing. And we'll talk today about different types of genre, but knowing what genre you're reading is like knowing what game you're playing. It's knowing what game you're playing. Are we, are we playing soccer? Because if we're playing soccer, you don't pick up the ball with your hands, you just use your feet. But if we're playing basketball, you don't use your feet. That's against the rules. You can't kick the ball. Well, how do we know? Well, it depends. The game you're playing will help you know what to do. 
if you go out on the field and run around, you go, I don't know what we're doing. Oh, well, we're going we're gonna to play uh, tag. We're going to play freeze tag. We're going to play. There's, if you know what game you're playing, you say, oh, okay, now I know what to do. Same thing with a genre. In 1 Peter, it's a letter, but it also contains different kinds of writing. Law, he talks, he'll reference back to the Old Testament law. He'll quote poetry. In fact, he may even write his own, some of his own poetry. He's going to quote prophecy. Uh, but essentially, when you pick up 1 Peter, it's a letter. It's a letter being written to someone or a group of people. So I want to talk just for a minute about ancient letters because they are different than ours. How do we start a letter? Dear. Dear. Whoever you're writing to. So, dear Michelle. And then some expressions of how you feel. Hope you're doing well. I uh, haven't seen you in a while. I miss you. I want to write you and tell you about whatever. And then you close it with uh, love, Jeff, sincerely. Jeff, respectfully. That's how we write letters. But in the ancient days, letters were a, a little bit different. They contained three main parts. An opening, which would include the sender. So when you look at your Bible there in 1st Peter, it starts out with who the writer is, who the sender is. Peter, and then a little bit about him. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he says who he's writing to. He's writing to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, and then those cities in modern Turkey. Tell us about them. Okay? Those to the recipients. And then he'll write a greeting. What's the greeting? May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And that is a very Christian <clears throat> greeting. For them to say grace and peace. It's very, very Christian to say grace from God, peace from God. And actually, uh, we know that a lot of times that Paul, the New Testament writers, will say, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this grace coming to you and peace coming to you are from God. And Paul as an apostle is, is taking that grace and, and distributing it out to the people he's writing to. So this is how he starts with this greeting. Then there would be a prayer or direct thanksgiving to God. And that's what we have here in verse 3. In fact, from verse 3 all the way down to verse 12, you have this sort of opening prayer, blessing God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he has this opening, has this... <clears throat> Uh, introduction and all of that from verse 1 to verse 12 is, is basically an opening part. It's a long that verse 3 to verse 12 is like one long sentence. The second part of the letter would be the body of the letter and that's where the main issues are discussed. The main issues are discussed. I want to tell you this while we're talking about it. Many times in these letters of the New Testament, the opening material, the, some of the, the comments that they will make in the opening will then be more explained in the body of the letter. You might get the whole outline of the letter in the first few verses. That's why it's so important. Because we open it up and we go, Paul and Apostle, Jesus Christ, it's like, come on, let's, let's get down to what's really important, but from right away, the very first few words are essential. I mean, this is scripture. This is God's word. These uh, letters of the Bible are given by God just like every other part of scripture. Just like the, the giving of the law is given by God. And we think about Moses up there, on the mountain and God writing with his finger on the tablets of stone. But these scriptures are also from God. And they're, they're all on the same, same level. So when you're reading a letter of the New Testament, P 
Peter is an apostle of Jesus Christ. You want to stop and think about that. This is Peter. That, where did he get the name Peter from? Because his name was Simon. So Jesus said, your name is Peter. On this rock I will build my church. He's given him that name of rock. That's what Peter means, rock. Or maybe we would say Rocky from our, our culture. Hey, Rocky. Hey, Rock. You know? But he is an apostle. He's, he's sent, he's commissioned by Jesus Christ. And he is writing to those who are exiles, chosen exiles. They're sojourners. They're having a hard time. They're away from home. So that those first few words in that first verse help us know what the rest of the book is about. What's the rest of 1 Peter about? I, I would say a central theme is their suffering. That they are suffering. They're away from the home that they want to be. Whether that's a heavenly home or their actual home. They're away from home and they're suffering. Their neighbors are starting to turn against them. And there's, there's persecution because they're Christians. And they're suffering. And Peter is going to write to encourage them. Say, hey, Jesus suffered for you. He led the way. Follow in his steps. So Peter is writing as an apostle, an official representative of the Lord himself. As such, this is not, it's not simply a, hey, how are you, friend to friend letter. But one written with Christ's authority. Okay, authority is your blank there. And I just, I think you're, you're aware of that, you understand that, appreciate it. But I want to make sure that when you come to your test at the end of class, that you remember this here, what I'm, what I'm saying about how these letters are as inspired as the rest of Scripture. While 1 Peter is an epistle, it contains other elements. So here they are, other genres. Genres. Is that a, is that a French word? Genre. Yes. Sure sounds like it. So if you have genres, genres, I won't even I won't even try. What's the first one? He quotes the law. Now when when I say the law, or when we talk about the law, I'm talking about the first five books of the Old Testament. The first five books of Moses. Um, yes. So he says, you shall be holy for I am holy. Which is a direct quote from Leviticus 11, 44. Direct. Do you guys need a couple of chairs? Oh, you can see us? <laughs> no, no. You're welcome. Come in. So when we talk about the law, I, we're specific, I'm saying capital L, law. This is the law of Moses. And Peter, Peter quotes it directly. Be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. When he talks about a ransom price or a lamb being without blemish or spot, that's referring to Old Testament language right from the law, Exodus chapter 12. He also will quote poetry. So that's another genre. So when, when we talk about poetry, where do we have an example of that? Chapter 1, you're right there in your, in your Bible, right? 1 Peter 1. He says, verse 24, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower... <clears throat> falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So that's poetry. That's Old Testament poetry that he is citing. Well, yes. We're glad. Uh, that's good stuff. So here, Peter is using, and I think Peter loves poetry. I don't know if we think about the fishermen loving poetry, but he did, and he probably sang, sang, sung, he probably would have sung these songs, these poems from 
from the Hebrew Bible. From the, so what do we have? He, he quotes Psalm, uh, Psalm 34 all over the place. Psalm 34, he speaks of those who have tasted that the Lord is good. That's Psalm 34, verse 8. Have you tasted that the Lord is good? Here's a fisherman writing about just how good God is. And he's sung these songs since he's been a kid, and here he is writing them out. He also inserts an extended quotation of Psalm 34 in chapter 3. Um, if you look at chapter 3, 1 Peter 3.10, for whoever desires to love light and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And he goes on, verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Here he is quoting or <coughs> quoting songs of poetry. Uh, and he has what we call confessional creeds, or they may have been hymns that they... They sung, that they sang. <laughs> they were singing. How's that? <laughs> so that would be in First Peter, Sing. chapter one, verse eighteen. Knowing you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And there's a couple other places that sound like these are, these are creeds. These are, we're taking the doctrine of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross, and we're making sure that everyone in the church has these basics done, these basic doctrines, and Peter is putting them in. Now, he may have written these as an apostle. It bugs me sometimes when I, I read, you're reading commentaries, and they will, they'll make a statement well, Peter probably gathered this from the churches around that were saying these things or singing these things. And I think, well, maybe, but he's an apostle of God. He could have just written this for us by the Holy Spirit. So I'll, I'll, I'll tend to lean that way. What else is, What other genre do we have that Peter uses? His prophecy. prophecy yeah. Old Testament prophecy. Particularly from Isaiah. He has Isaiah chapter 8 and Isaiah 28. He goes from Psalm 118, which speaks of Christ as the stone and the cornerstone. We see that there in 1 Peter 2, 6. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And never be ashamed that you've believed in Christ. So that comes from the Old Testament. That comes from poetry, but prophecy. It's prophecy that's telling us God is going to put a stone of foundation that he's going to build on. And Peter says, oh, oh guys, guys, that's Jesus. That, that you have known, that psalm that you have known and your parents knew and, and all the way back through history, that's Jesus. And he, this is what the, the apostles do. They, they'll take the Old Testament and they say, look how awesome this is. This fits together with exactly with who Jesus is and what he has done. He is that cornerstone. So here's Peter. He's writing a letter, but he's going to quote the law, pro poetry, prophecy. What else do we have? So the next one I have is End times uh, would be how we would say it, or apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Which is right. If you want to have like the the real technical term, apocalyptic, the end times. Where does Peter write about that? Especially go to this in, in chapter four, verse seventeen. It's almost. It's a, di it's a different genre. Because he's been writing, he's saying, uh, the Lord has suffered for you, you're suffering, but show a good testimony among the people around you. They're going to want to ask you about the hope that is within you, so be ready for that. But then he also warns of judgment coming. He says in verse 17, for it is time for judgment 
to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? This is a warning about the judgment of God that is coming. His, his judgment is coming. And starting at us as a church, I look at that and think, are there unbelievers within the church who are pretending to be Christians and they're very nice when they come to church and they like, who wouldn't want to come to church? You know, there's nice people there, there's free coffee. <laughs> And people will come, and there's a social aspect to it, and they feel like they're a part of something. Maybe they feel like they're earning some credit with God while I go to church. They, they feel kind of proud about what they're doing, but they have no faith in Christ. They go, they leave, and they're just the same as they were before. And when the judgment of God comes, the, those who are unbelievers will be lost. I mean, they will be destroyed. Just saying, Lord, Lord, I, Lord, Lord, have we not done so many things in your name? And he goes, I never, I never knew you. Depart from me. I think that's what Peter has in mind in this warning of the judgment beginning at the household of God. And so there's this warning, if the righteous is scarcely saved, and we're only saved by his grace, certainly not by our efforts. We're only saved by what Christ has done. If the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? It's, it's a warning. If you're, if you're sitting there and you're going, oh, that's me. I, I, need to, I need to find out more about this and make sure that I'm, that I'm saved. Because I know I've been a sinner. I know I've been ungodly. And there's this, this warning that is there. That's part of the, the, the genre. It's a different kind of genre. All right, now, I want to talk with you about tone. Because... I have read a, quite a few books on Bible interpretation or hermeneutics, and there's very little talk about tone. So what do I mean by tone? Um, so let's say my daughter, if, when, when Maddie was little, if she was going to um, color on the wall. And I saw her, she loves to color and do art. If I saw her take the cover off a marker and start heading over to the wall, I would say, Maddie? But if she was out in the yard and I had come home with ice cream, how would I, how would I call her name? I would say, Maddie! But there's a different tone between you're in big trouble <laughs> and I have ice cream for you. We use tone of voice to communicate an emotion of this is why this is important. And different settings will call for a different tone of voice. And the scripture writers have different tones. Um, tone is pathos, or here's your blank, feeling. And you go, wait a minute now, Jeff, we're, we're Baptists, we we're not interested in feelings. <laughs> okay, granted, the, the writer means to communicate a feeling through the text. It's the lowercase s spirit of the text. It's the spirit. It's the Stephen Smith, and I, I've got that in, in your notes there, that's his name. Stephen Smith has written a little book called Reclaiming the Voice of God. And it's really good. Let me, I'm going to write just reclaiming so you can remember that. Reclaiming the Voice of God. He's a pastor in Louisiana. One of my professors and really helped me understand this. So Paul's tone, we'll talk about Paul just for a minute. Paul's tone can be harsh when he says, Oh, foolish Galatians. We, you know right away that's very serious. Galatians is the only epistle 
that Paul writes where he doesn't compliment or praise the people he's writing to. He just gets right to it with like, hey, I am so discouraged how you're treating the gospel and taking on another gospel, which isn't even a gospel, he says. But that's, uh, oh foolish Galatians, uh, Paul says, I warn them now, if I come again, I will not spare them. That's 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, do you want me to come with a rod? This is 1 Corinthians. So we can pick up his, his tone, but also he can be gentle, like with the Thessalonians, where he says, we know brothers, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. And he's writing with this tone of compassion as he edifies or begins to edify, is your blank, he begins to edify those suffering exiles, this is Peter, immediately with his excited reminder that they, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So 1 Peter 1.5 is one of my most, most, most favorite verses because I doubted my salvation until I knew about 1 Peter 1.5. I was always asking the Lord to save me. If I didn't mean it last night, I mean it tonight. Please come into my heart and save me. If I didn't say the words right, tonight I want to, I just, I want you to, I want to be saved. So I was 6 and I was 10, 13, and 18, and just, Lord, save me, save me, save me. And then I come to my pastor, and he says, 1 Peter 1, 5, you are kept by the power of God. Not by the words that you prayed, or how many times that you prayed, or how much you meant it. You're kept by the power of God. And that was such a a revelation to me. It was such an encouragement. It was such a comfort to my heart. I believed in Jesus. He died for me. He rose again. I want to I wanna be saved. And he says, I'm keeping you. You're kept by the power of God. And so that's how Peter starts out encouraging these ones who are exiles, sojourners, away from their home. It is according to God's sovereign will that they are grieved by various trials. Yes, it is necessary what you're facing. Your, your faith is going to be tested, but you're going to shine like gold. And let me give you this encouragement, Peter says in 1.13. The future is bright because when Christ comes back, he's coming back with grace. Set your, set your hope fully on the grace that will be yours at the appearing of the Lord Jesus. Like, put your, put your attention, set your heart that Christ is coming back, and he's coming back with grace for you. So that's the tone that Peter writes with to these believers. He wants to encourage. He's got, I, I've got this whole list here we're going to talk about together as a class. He's got this whole list of commands, imperatives that he's giving. He's going to tell them to do a lot of things, and it's going to be hard things. But he says, first of all, God is keeping you. And he's coming back for you with grace. So then, here's how you should live. So how should we consider the imperatives in 1 Peter? Or what, you ready for your blank? What tones do you sense in these? What tones? So there might be a, there might be a different tone of voice that the apostle is writing with. So I've got a whole list of these. We, we won't have time to look at them all, but and I've just mentioned set your hope fully on future grace. So that sounds like an encouraging tone. What about uh, 1 Peter 1.15? Be holy, for I am holy. Okay, so it's a command, it's an imperative. How do you what kind of a tone does that sound like to you? How is the apostle saying it within the context of what he is writing. Maybe we have to back up and get a little context. Verse 14. As obedient children, so how is he talking to them? He calls them children. Like a dad. Like a dad. Okay, so this is a fatherly kind of tone, am I right? So as obedient children, 
Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That, that sinfulness that you used to live in. But, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fatherly. What's that? Authority. There's, a, there's authority that he speaks in. There is certainly a seriousness about it. Right? I mean, it's just, I think there is a soberness. He's saying, look at your heavenly father and how holy that he is. That's how he wants you to be. I mean, that's a sobering thought. You're right. Say, okay, this is, take, take this seriously. Um, live in reverent fear. Love one another. How about two, uh, chapter 2, verse 2? Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. It does. It sounds poetic. It's figurative language. We're going to talk about. We'll have a whole. We'll have a whole session on just figure of speech. But now it, it it's it maybe a little different tone there. Mm -hmm. He's talking to them still as children, but like think about babies. How they they're just desperate for that milk. They just have to have that milk. That's how you should be. The milk of the Lord. The milk of the Word. To, because the Lord is so good. Have you tasted and seen how good the Lord is? It's a, a spirit of encouragement, of uh, glory, looking up to God, and, and of praise, thinking about what he's given to us in that man. Uh, put aside sin, keep a good testimony for the lost, uh, submit to, to authority. That's, we'll talk about that. So even the slaves are to submit their authority. Be humble. And then let's get that very last one, chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 12. <clears throat> By Sylvanus. Oh, who's Sylvanus? Another, word, another name for Silas. Um, but who, what is he, what is he to Peter? A faithful brother. Yes? What else? Because it says, by Sylvanus. He's one of our Okay, he's probably writing it. So is he the writer or is Peter the writer? Secretary. Secretary? Mm -hmm. I'm going to dictate to you what you're going to write. And the Holy Spirit is the one giving the words. So the Holy Spirit, I would say, is working through the Apostle Peter, who is speaking this letter out, and Sylvanus, or Silas, is writing it. So he gets a, a little bit of credit. Uh, by Sylvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you. So I think that's where we get this. Sylvanus was the writer, but Peter was telling him what to write. Does that make sense? Yes. It was, so it's not the first epistle of Sylvanus. He just maybe was better at writing than Peter. Okay. So he says, I am exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. And he tells us there at the end what this epistle is about. I am writing to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. What is the true grace of God? Probably the whole letter that he has gotten from the Holy Spirit. He's giving it to those believers. This is the true grace of God. It's about Jesus who suffered for your sins. And you follow in his steps. This is the true grace of God. And then he says, stand firm in it. What kind of a command is that? What's the tone of that? Well, it's encouragement. There's no doubt about it. And part of it, Randy, the reason it's encouragement is he's talking about grace. This is grace. Now I'm going to give you a command. Stand in that grace. I mean, it's, it's, there's authority there. There is encouragement there. There is compassion. And it's, it's to build them up. Stand in grace. It's God has blessed you more than you deserve. 
You didn't earn this or deserve it, but you have it now. Stand there. Don't go off into legalism. Don't go off trying to earn your own salvation. Just stand in the grace that God has given to you. Stand firm in it. Don't let anything blow you away or push you away from what God has done for you in Christ. Stand firm in this grace. So it's a command, but looking around and seeing what he's saying, I think, helps understand how it was being said and how it applies to us. All right, we've got to wrap this up. Um, back, so back to your notes. Occasion, when we get to session eight, we'll talk more about this idea of occasion. But most of the letters of the, of the New Testament were written for a reason. There was something going on that the writer wants to write this letter to. There, there was a reason for it. For Peter, I think it would be because of the suffering being experienced by these believers who are sojourners and exiles for Christ. And Peter exalts the Lord. He, he, he says, in light of God's past, present, and future blessings, he calls them to live godly lives together as a church, as a testimony to the world around them. So that's, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about a case, uh, occasion, why Peter was writing, and we'll think about some other examples of that too. So in conclusion, this section on genre and tone, Stephen W. Smith, who wrote this book, Reclaiming the Voice of God, write the rest of that there. Reclaiming the Voice of God, Pastor Jeff, yes. in your note you have recapturing the voice of God. Recapturing? Uh, I would probably, I'd probably go with that then. <laughs> <laughs> recapturing? Why, that sounds even better, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try recapturing the voice of God. Stephen Smith says, the biblical writers were adept at not just communicating propositional truth, but also tremendous emotion through their words. So, when you come to 1 Peter and it says, be holy, for I am holy, you don't, you don't want to read it that way. Be holy, for I am holy. You, you want to say, how was he saying this? Why was this so important? Did Peter ever struggle with personal holiness? Sure, sure. Peter said, I am an unclean man. He, he, didn't, he was afraid to be in the presence of the Lord. Depart from me. So Peter says, I know the Lord is holy, and we are to be holy. I'm, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that has not changed. We are to be holy. When we come to a passage that is unusually forthright and strong, we allow it to land with all the force of the text. We are not just getting into the mind of the apostle. We are getting into his heart. And the genre demands this. These are letters. That's what we're studying, 1 Peter. These are letters, and they are personal. Personal. Indeed, the genre and tone of a passage will contribute to the overall understanding of every biblical text. Every biblical text. So, another area of study to consider. So, we're, we're all finished with that, except I want to give you some homework. Yeah, who likes homework? You don't have to raise your hand. Yes, 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 yes. good. All right, I've got two passages in 1 Peter that are difficult. And I want you, I'm asking you, if you have time this week, or if you make a little time, I would like to know the meaning of 1 Peter 4.1. So, 1 Peter 4.1. What does this mean? Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So, that will be your first question. So, next week, when we come into class, we'll, we'll try to jump right in. To that, and, and we'll see what we come up with. And then here's your second 
uh, homework. And this is even on the, on the test. So, have you ever heard of teaching to the test? That's what we're doing. Who are the dead in 1 Peter 4, 6? Who are the dead or those who have died? So, we want to talk about the meaning of 1 Peter 4, 1, and then who are the ones who have died in 4, 6? So that's your homework. We'll pick it up next week when we get back together. God bless you.